Okay, here's the third part of the Introduction to Psychology PowerPoint Lecture Series. Um, I'm still assuming at this point you may not have your textbooks because you're looking at this in week one, early week one at that. If you do have your books, it's a great idea to go ahead and start looking at the introduction chapter, chapters one and, and two maybe, but definitely chapter one. If you don't have it yet, it's not a big deal. Don't panic. I'm going to try to get you through some of that here with these. Uh, video lecture, same deal, take notes, uh, you're going to be accountable for this information uh, for the exam, so treat this just like you're in class. So moving on to the next question, can, can psychology explain why we prefer or like different things? Because we all have different preferences. So can it explain? Why is it that people are attracted to other individuals, interpersonally or romantically? Can psychology explain homosexual orientation or relationships. Why is it that the rich tend to stay with the rich? The middle class tend to stay with middle class. Poor people tend to stay with poor people. Maybe psychology can explain our music preferences. Think about the musicians that you like. Um, I've tried to find some contemporary folks here for you f to, to some extent. Um, can psychology explain why you like rap music or why you may like country music or why you may like heavy metal or maybe you like everything? Um, does it have to do with your age, uh, where you're born, if you had been born in New York City, or maybe you, if you were born being a different race, of a different race or of a different ethnicity, would that make a difference in your music preferences? Uh, perhaps, and probably. So psychology attempts to explain and understand why we have these differences in preference. And I'm kind of going through some of the my favorite musicians and bands from the 70s when I was alive. You've probably never heard of some of these people. But my age helps to explain why I like or prefer certain types of music. My parents, my grandparents, same thing. Their age has a lot to do with their preferences. So psychology can attempt to explain, for example, why men in the 1980s and 90s could dress up like women, like drag queens, essentially, and still be very popular with girls. Uh, when I ask the question today, of girls in my classes, would you go out with a guy who looks like this? The answer is almost invariably no, I would not go out with a guy like that. But 25, 30 years ago, every girl that I knew would go out with guys that dressed like this because they were popular at that time. So psychology can go a little sociology here and try to capture the essence or the spirit of the times to explain why things are popular or why we may prefer certain things. Clothing preferences, for example. I think we should bring back this look, guys. I'm not going to say that I ever wore my sweater tied around my shirt, but maybe I did. Probably not a good look now. Um, but again, back in the 1980s and 90s, it was acceptable. A lot of what we wear is an outward expression of what we embrace and who we are, how we identify ourselves. Um, to understand you know, why we wear certain types of clothing, why we wear our hair a certain way. So psychology can, can try to explain these things as well. So if you remember, psychology is the scientific study of behaviors and thought processes. Again, there's a scientific uh, system to this. Now, we're changing forces a little bit here, and this is also very important to have in your notes. Uh, your book does talk about this. I'm going to expand it and expound upon it a bit. Uh, there are three levels of psychological analysis. There are three different levels of analysis, and you're going to want to have each of them in your notes. We're going to start with the level of the brain. Now, psychology at times can focus specifically on the brain as an organ itself. Um, we know that certain parts of the brain control certain parts of our functioning, and at some point later in the semester, we're going to talk about the different parts of the brain, sort of what those parts of the brain are responsible for. Uh, some parts of the brain are responsible for visual perception, uh, for reality testing, for motor coordination, um, etc., auditory processing, um, memory, speech, etc., etc. And we'll talk about the different lobes, you can kind of see them here, of the brain and sort of what each lobe controls. So sometimes it's important and appropriate to look at the level of the brain. If you injure a specific part of the brain, it's going to reflect or it's going to impact the person uh, in specific ways. Uh, you want to write this in your notes too. Certain parts of the brain, if they're damaged, 
if they're atypical or unusual, can reflect specific mental health disorders. Sometimes um, the unborn child, the fetus, uh, during development, if something is wrong or something goes um, uh, goes you know sort of to the left, and the brain does not develop the way it's supposed to, that can impact how that child functions. It can impact how that child functions into uh, into adulthood and beyond. Uh, it can impact in intellectual functioning. It can impact a lot of different areas. It could also reflect specific mental health disorders. Here's a, a great example of something at the level of the brain. Uh, clinical depression. Probably everybody knows someone who has clinical depression. Um, what we know about depression is that there are lower than average levels of serotonin and other neurotransmitters in the brain of people who are depressed. So we can actually look at the brain of a person with depression and see and understand that they have lower levels of these brain chemicals than those without depression level of the brain. So we can give medications, psychiatrists who are medical doctors can prescribe medications to raise those levels to bring them up to sort of an average or an even level to help fight depression. Physical trauma to any part of the brain can result in a myriad of problems. Uh, mental impairment. Uh, if someone is mentally impaired, they are functioning significantly below average IQ. They're not just a little dull, they're like several standard deviations below average um, to the point where they may not be able to function sufficiently or be self-sufficient. Um, I, I know many stories as a psychologist, many stories of people who are functioning very well maybe even high functioning, very intelligent, but they have a head injury, an automobile accident, they get into a fight, you know, and there, there's so much brain damage that it renders them mentally impaired. Uh, I worked with a client at Mount Olive who supposedly had an IQ of 130, which is in the genius area, and he was assaulted by another inmate. He was hit in the head with a weight bar so many times that it probably should have killed him. Uh, it did not kill him. But by the time he recovered, he was basically a walking vegetable. I think his IQ was assessed somewhere around the 50s, which is 100 is average. So he was very, very, very much below average. Uh, physical trauma to the brain can result in personality disorders or, certain, or significant personality changes. Um, I knew a woman who suffered a terrible head injury uh, before her head injury. and She was an older lady. Uh, she was very kind, was gentle was nurturing, very cooperative, very what I would call a very grandma-like kind of person. Uh, after her head injury, after she recovered, she became very paranoid, uh, didn't trust people, was very nasty and mean, even rude, to, to everyone around her, and no one could figure it out. And finally I sat down and thought, it's her head injury, it's, it's changed her personality. I would ask you if we were in class if you know anyone who's had a head injury, has their personality changed? And most people, when I ask that in class, most students will say, yeah, probably some, or a little bit. Uh, that's not uncommon. I'm going to go ahead and call that the end of this part of the video lecture.